And today we're going to be looking at the first three verses of Hebrews chapter one. So let me read them to you and then we'll jump in. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us in his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I love these verses. They thrill my heart. And they are what theologians refer to as uh, Christological. It's a, it's a Christological passage. It's a passage that's very much focused on Christ and um, understanding the, the depths of who Christ is. And we, we have a few of these in the New Testament. Uh, Colossians chapter one, we have a similar kind of a Christological passage. And then John chapter one, which we're probably most familiar with, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, that's another one of these uh, strong Christological passages. So um, this, is a, this is a profound uh, series of statements here. And it's, it's one of these things that as a, as a teacher of God's word, you come to it and you feel completely inadequate. You look at this and you think, what, what can I possibly say about this? It's just, it's so far beyond me. But we just pray that uh, God will have mercy on us and he will help uh, as we attempt to get from the, the passage here the things that God would have for us uh, today. So let me remind you, Hebrews was written to those who were faltering in their profession of faith. They, they were faltering. They were, they were contemplating... Uh, a return to the, the, Jew, the, the Judaic system, the, the old Mosaic system, the temple worship and so forth. And they were faltering because they had lost sight of the glorious majesty of Christ. They, they had lost sight. In the beginning, they saw who Jesus was and they were so overwhelmed with his goodness and his grace and they were taken up with that and they were so excited initially in their and they're following him. They were willing to, to lose their possessions and their positions in society. They didn't care. But now some years have passed, maybe a couple of decades, and things haven't quite worked out the way they had expected. And, you know, different challenges and difficulties were coming along. And, and Jesus had not yet come back to set up the Davidic kingdom. So they started thinking, well, maybe, maybe we need to go back to Judaism. And so the writer of this letter sets out to immediately correct their error by setting forth the unique glory of the Son of God. The writer says, right, right from the very beginning, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go back because in going back, this is what you're moving away from. And then he lays out for us in these... Um, the seven majestic assertions he lays out for us just who Christ is. And you know, I think it's still absolutely true today that for anyone who is tempted to move away from Christ, whatever direction you're going in, some people might be tempted to move uh, away from Christ towards some other religious experience. Uh, most of the time people are tempted to move away from Christ because there's something in the world that's attracting to them. They they're, they're, think they're gonna find peace or fulfillment or, or happiness or whatever. They think they're gonna find it somewhere else. Uh, the truths in these seven assertions are there to remind us that there's nowhere to go, that there's nothing. There's no religion that could ever possibly do for you uh, what Christ has done for you. There's nothing the world can offer that could ever be a substitute for him and who he is. And so just as, as the author saw this 
uh, presentation of Christ in his glory as a, um, as a remedy for their hardened hearts and their strained hearts, so the same is true for us today. The surest way back to where we should be in our relationship with God is through personally laying hold of who Jesus truly is. And according to our text, he is the heir of all things. He is the creator of all things. He is the radiance of God's glory. He's the express or the exact image of his person. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the great redeemer. And ultimately, he is the ruler of the universe. And so those are the things that we want to consider as we think about for just a few minutes this passage here today. So first of all, he is the appointed heir of all things. Jesus owns everything. Everything belongs to him. When the Bible says in the Old Testament, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, it's referring to Christ. Everything belongs to Jesus Christ. Every square inch of this planet, every, uh, the, the far reaches of the universe, it all belongs to him. Every single thing that there is was made by him and it was made for him. He is the heir of everything. We read it there in that second Psalm. God said, ask of me to the son, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And that's exactly what we have presented here in Hebrews, that Christ is the appointed heir of all things. Now, it's interesting to me that Islam, Islam's goal is world dominance. And, and the interesting thing about Islamic theology is that in Islamic theology, the most important thing is real estate. The most important thing is, is conquering land. So we have had in, in history past, and uh, we're, we're, there's a, a revisitation to the idea of a, of a caliphate. And so a caliphate is, uh, it's the dominion of Islam over regions, but the ultimate goal of Islam is to uh, have a universal caliphate, a universal rule over the world. Uh, Islam is not so concerned that every human being be converted to Islam. What is concerned is that the whole world be subjected to Islam. So you can still be uh, a person of another faith, but you're under the dominion of Islam because it's all about the real estate. It's all about taking over land. Now, I find that interesting, and the reason I bring it up is because it's clear that those principalities and powers that are the inspiration behind Islam, it's clear that they are in revolt to this idea that Jesus owns everything. They are attempting, among others, but, but they are attempting to uh, remove any uh, trace of Christ or any, any, um, any references to Christ from the world. And we see this with what's happening with ISIS as they're going into the different uh, ancient cities and you find the churches and the, the monuments, anything that, that reminds people that Christianity was once there, what are they doing? They're completely destroying it. They're going in with their sledgehammers and their uh, dynamite and all of that, and they're just, they're just blowing these things to bits, these, these old uh, historic church buildings and so forth, because they wanna obliterate the name of Christ. But it's not just the, the radical uh, Islamists who are doing that. Uh, the radical um, leftists in our culture, they wanna do the same thing. G get the name of Jesus as far from this society as we can. And it, you know, if you have to have them in, in the society, then keep them inside those church buildings, but don't let them out. We don't want his name mentioned in public. We don't want any public recognition of him. And we see it's the same sort of thing. It's, this, it's just this rebellion against the fact that Christ is the heir 
of the world. Everything belongs to him. But once again, as we read in the psalm, what does God think about this revolt? Now, when we think about this revolt, we uh, can get very, very depressed. We, we, we become concerned. And we sit on earth oftentimes wringing our hands thinking, oh, God, look what they're doing. Look how they're trying to obliterate your, uh, your any, any sense of your, of your uh, reality. Look how they're trying to you know, push you out of the culture. And, and we're wringing our hands and we're uh, depressed over that and we're, we're upset about that. And what's God doing? He that sits in heaven laughs. God is laughing. He's not wringing his hands. He's not saying, oh, poor me. They're driving me out of my world. No, he's still in control. He owns everything. And he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. He shall hold them in derision. And you know, God's gonna do what he's gonna do. And guess what? All of the armies of the world aren't gonna be able to stop him. They're gonna try to at some point. But they're not going to be able to. Because God has declared it right there in that psalm that was read to us today. God has declared, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Oh, Zion. Ever hear the term Zionist? Well, that's an evil term today in the minds of many people. They talk about those Zionists. You know, those Jews there in, in Israel. And of course, for the Muslims, they, again, they want to drive them out. And then for the secularists, you know, what are, those, what are those Jews doing? They're messing up everything with this Zionism. And Zionism has is, is become a, a, a synonym for something evil. They try to compare it with something like a, apartheid in South Africa or something like that. I think it's interesting that God has declared in this second psalm, which is a prophetic psalm, he's made it emphatic. I have, he doesn't say Jerusalem, although it is Jerusalem. He says, Zion, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. It's just a reminder, again, that God's in charge and Christ is the heir of everything. So Jesus Christ, the author tells us, he possesses everything. It all belongs to him. And then the second thing he tells us is that he's the creator of it all. I don't know that we always realize that or remember that. When we think of creation, are we remembering that when we're talking about the creator, we're talking specifically about Christ, the son. And once again, we see this, this intense battle in our culture over the, the subject of creationism. Why is this such a heated topic? Why is there so much uh, vitriol when it comes to the, this whole issue of a creator. It's because the biblical claim is that Jesus is the creator. And of course, those spiritual forces of darkness and the men that are under their sway, they are in complete opposition to that. They resist that. They oppose that. But it doesn't change anything. Everything was made by Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 3 says it this way. All things were made by him, and without him, not one single thing was made that was made. Do we realize that? Not one single thing that was made was made apart from Christ. From the largest heavenly bodies contained within the, the hundred billion stars multiplied by the hundred billion galaxies, you know, the, the largest body in heaven, whatever star that is, that, that takes up the most mass, the most space, what, whatever that is, Christ made that, but he also made the subatomic particles that fill the universe. So the quark, the neutrino, the, these little subatomic particles, Jesus made all of those things. Jesus made the earth that we live on. And he made everything here in our world. He made every insect. He made every animal, every plant, every tree. He made the water that is unique to our planet to give us that 
as drink to, to clean with, to be refreshed by. He made the air that we breathe. And of course, he made us. He made us in his own image and according to his likeness. But do we realize this? Do we, do we live with the consciousness of this? When we go out in the morning and we look at, uh, you know, maybe we look at the flowers that are there, you know, somewhere out in front of our house or something. Or we look at the trees there, or we, we look up at the blue sky, we look at the clouds. Or maybe we go down to the coast and we look at the sea. And, uh, or, or maybe we, you know, we see a, an unusual insect, something so intricate and, and yet something so uh, specifically designed. We think, wow, look at that thing. Look at that bug. That is so weird. And then stop and think, Jesus made that. Whoa, that's even more crazy. He made that. And then, or, or you know, just, just think of any animal you want to think about. Sometimes in our backyard, we'll get a, a hummingbird out there that'll just hover over our nectarine tree. And, you know, you look at a hummingbird, and here's this thing. It's not supposed to do what it does. It just hovers there. I think, Jesus made that. Or, or what, you know, whatever else you want to think about. You know, any, any of the uh, animals that we know of and the, the complexity of them and the, just how, how marvelous and amazing they are. We were, you know, in Israel just recently, of course, in Israel, you, you see a lot of camels. You don't normally see camels here in Orange County, <laughs> but they're all over Israel. And, and you look at these camels and you think, I, I was what, you know, I was watching the camel. I was watching it prance along. And now in my mind, when I think about camels, I don't think of prancing. I sort of think of trudging. But I was absolutely amazed as I was watching this camel trot by, and I was amazed at how, it, you know, it's it, like its feet, um, it's, its paws, but, you know, it's like, it's like a paw and a hoof combined. But the thing that was really interesting to me was the, the amazing flexibility of it. I, I kind of always thought of, like, camels as being, um, you know, kind of a real stiff sort of a ride, but these things are agile. They're much more agile than I, I thought. And, you know, they're, it was almost like it was made of rubber. <laughs> and I was, I was looking at it like thinking, wow, this is, this is crazy. This is a camel. Jesus made this thing. And he made it for a specific purpose. And, you know, camels can go forever without water and all of the kinds of things, you know. They, they store the water and, and kind of recycle it. And the, but here's my point. When we look at these things, I think for the most part, we just look at them and we might even marvel at them and think, wow, that's interesting. But do we stop and think, Jesus made that. My Savior made that. This is all part of his handiwork because everything that there is. Not one single thing that was made was made apart from him. When we look at ourselves, when we look at humanity, when we look at the amazing creativity of human beings, when we look at the artistic abilities that people have and things like that, do we stop and think, wow, this is what it means to be made in the image of God. God's a creator and man is a creator also because he's made in the image of God. But see, this is what the author wants these, these Jewish believers to remember. Wait, what are you thinking? You're thinking about going back to this, this system, this ritualistic system that God has um, now abandoned because he's fulfilled it all? And in doing so, think about who you're leaving. You're leaving the heir of everything. You're leaving the creator of everything. But then he goes on and he says concerning Christ that he is the brightness or the radiance of God's glory. He is the, the shining forth of the glory of God, Jesus is. I love the way Paul put it in writing to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he says that um, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
He is the brightness of his glory, or he is the radiance of his glory. The great Puritan theologian, Jonathan Edwards, he, he said that, the, that nature itself, he said God created things the way he did intentionally and built into nature uh, things about himself. So we could look at certain things in nature and learn things about God. And Jonathan Edwards pointed to the sun. And he said, in the Son, you see the Trinity. God the Father is the Son. God the Son, Jesus Christ, he is the rays of the Son. He's the radiance of the Son. He's the brightness of the Son. And then he said, and the Holy Spirit is the warmth of the Son. But I think that's such a great picture. You know, when, you, when we go out of here today, if you look up at the Son, well, you know, the reality is you're not seeing the Son. You're seeing the rays of the Son. And so it is true, when you look at God, it's the Son of God, it's the radiance of God, it's those rays coming from the Father, the Son is that, that's how we see God. Jesus, you remember, he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And this is how we see him. He is the radiance of God's glory, and then he said that he is the express image of his person. He is the express image of his person. He is the identical, the, the, the exact representation is uh, another way that this is translated. And the idea of an exact representation refers that the reference here, the point of reference would have been a coin. A coin which perfectly corresponds to the image on the die. Now, you know, coins are minted and they're, you know, they're, they're cast in a die and a, and a coin, even our coins, of course, they have uh, the images of the different presidents and you know, uh, founders of the country on them. And you pull out a quarter and you look at it and you've got there the image of George Washington. Well, that image on the coin is identical to the image in the die from which it was cast. And so that's the, the illustration that the author is using here. Jesus is therefore completely the same in his being as the Father. However, there is still an important distinction. Both exist separately, as do the die and the image. So he is the brightness of his glory. He is the exact representation of of his person. So the author, if there was ever a, a passage of scripture that stated unequivocally the, the divine nature of Christ, this is, this is it. You can't be the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his person, the identical representation of his person. You can't be that without being God. And that's, the, the author is going to make that clear as he goes through the letter. Again, he's reminding them, look, to leave, to leave Jesus and faith in Jesus is, is really to, to ultimately leave God. But then he says another thing. He says that he is the upholder of all things. All things are upheld or sustained by him. You know, the biblical picture of the current situation it's not that God created the world, set it in motion, fixed certain laws, and then kind of went off to do something else. The biblical picture is that God is still very actively involved in the day-to-day -day running of the universe. As a matter of fact, he keeps things going as they are. When we get up in the morning, we have every confidence that the sun will rise. We know that it will set at a certain point in the evening. At least that's our perception of it. We know it's doing something a little bit different. But from our point of view, the sun is rising and setting. And we can calculate when uh, the various seasons are going to come and all of that. It's, that's all because everything is, is just perfectly set and it stays that way. Why does it stay that way? When you look up... Uh, in the sky on a, on a moonlit night, maybe it's a full moon, and you're looking at the moon. Have you ever wondered, like, 
you know, how does that thing just hang out there? I mean, who, who's holding it up? Why doesn't it go somewhere else? Why does it stay fixed where it is? There's, there's nothing holding it that we can see. And if we could go to the moon and look back on the earth, we'd find we've got the same situation. How is it that the earth stays fixed in its orbit? How is it that it, you know, it, it rotates like it does? How does this happen? And how does it happen consistently? Well, this is what we're told right here, that it happens because of Christ. He is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. We speak of the laws of nature or the laws of physics, but these are just what we call the things we observe but don't know the why or the how of these things. Any honest scientist will tell you about these certain laws of physics, but they could never tell you, well, the real why or the how. They can explain what it seems to be doing, but they can't tell you why it's doing that, and they can't really even tell you how it's doing that. You see, here we are told that it's Jesus Christ, that he is the one who sustains the universe and keeps it inhabitable for us. Now, scientists these days are talking more and more, and more about uh, what's called the fine-tuning of the universe. This is, this is big talk in the scientific community t these days, and it's controversial, and uh, for some people, it's a great argument for the existence of a creator, the existence of a designer, because what they've discovered is that there's this unbelievable precision. It's so precise that, that uh, it couldn't have just randomly happened this way. So this fine-tuning, for those who, who are theists, those who believe that there's a God, this is a strong argument for them. For those who still reject the idea that there's a God, this is perplexing. This is troubling. Uh, of course, they are you know, going to find some explanation uh, to make themselves not have to face the reality, like the multiverse theory. You're familiar with the multiverse theory now? Uh, you know, we've always been taught that there's a universe. Now there's a, a group of scientists who are saying, no, there's not a universe. There's a multiverse. There's an infinite number of universes. And the reasoning goes like this. If there's an infinite number of universes, there has to be at least one where everything is precise and perfect. So we just happen to be that one. It, it happens through chance. If you've got an infinite number, there's the, then the chance that one's going to end up perfect like this. There's no evidence for multiverses, but it's a way to get around <laughs> the, the fine-tuning argument. But the fine-tuning has to do, like I said, with precision. So scientists are noting the absolute precision in distance, size, weight, gravitational force, um, the things that they're observing in the universe. Now, here's an example of what we're talking about here. Now, if you could take a tape measure and stretch it across the universe. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a debate as to uh, the, the size of the universe, uh, the, the width of the universe. Uh, some say it's 91 billion light years. Others say, no, 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 it's 150 billion light years. Now, who could ever figure that out or who, who could ever try to argue that? I, I'd have no idea. But that's what they say. So let's just take the more conservative distance of 91 billion light years. Now remember, a light year is the distance light travels in one year. And the speed of light, we know, is 186,000 miles per second. So light traveling at 186,000 miles per second for one year is a light year. They say the universe is 91 billion light years across. So we've got a really long tape measure. <laughs> We've got this thing to go across the universe. But here's where it gets completely crazy. So here's what you do. You mark at one point on the tape, and this mark signifies the gravitational force. So the, the place you mark, you can mark it anywhere, but it signifies the gravitational force. If you were to move that mark one inch in either direction, 
you would completely destroy the possibility of life as we know it. You would completely destroy the possibility of there even being an earth. That is how precise things are. And they have discovered, again, uh, believing scientists and unbelieving scientists are seeing the same thing. They discovered about 12 different things that are just like that, that, that seem to indicate that this, you know, precision like this doesn't happen accidentally. Random actions do not produce precision, but that's what we see. But once again, the author here is telling us that everything is upheld by the word of his power. Jesus is the one who's holding things together. Paul, in writing to the Colossians, he uses these terms. He says, in him, all things consist or literally are held together. So it's all being held together by Christ. Things are the way they are, perfectly, precisely divine or uh, designed because Christ is the one behind it. And with that being the case, I, I think what John Owen, the, the Puritan writer said, I think he was <laughs> absolutely right. He said this, this fact abundantly shows the folly of those who enjoy life on earth and yet oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. His own power is the very ground that they stand upon in their opposition to him. And all things that they use against him consist in him. They exist absolutely at the pleasure of him whom they oppose. And they act against him without whose continual support and influence they could neither live nor act for one moment, which is the greatest madness and most contemptible folly imaginable. It's so true. I mean, you think of the, the atheist who's angry and ranting and renouncing God and mocking God, and uh, the very breath that he's doing that with is given to him by God. The very breath that he's inhaling is given to him by God. The very lungs that can contain the breath were created by God. It reminds me of Belshazzar, the ancient Babylonian king. You remember the story in Daniel chapter five where uh, Belshazzar was throwing a party for all of his lords. And many years earlier, his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem, and when he destroyed the temple, he took the, uh, the different um, pieces uh, of uh, the utensils from the temple. He took the cups and the bowls and the things that they used in the, the worship in the temple. He brought them to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar never touched them. He just kept them there. But Belshazzar decides, as he's having a, a drunken feast with his friends, he decides, we're gonna bring those out and we're gonna use them to toast the gods of gold and silver and wood and stone. And there they are. They're mocking God. They're having a big party. And suddenly, in the midst of the party, there appears a hand. Not connected to a body, there appears a hand and it's writing in the stucco on the wall. And this kind of spoils the party, as you could imagine. <laughs> and it says, concerning Belshazzar, I love what it says. It says, and his knees smote one against the other. This guy was scared. He was scared to death. And nobody could interpret what it was. And he had heard there was a, a man in, in his grandfather's court back in the earlier time. Anyway, Daniel finally comes in. And Daniel says, okay, I'm gonna tell you what the, what the writing on the wall means. And I'm gonna tell you why this moment has come and why tonight you're gonna be slain and your kingdom is gonna be overthrown. This is what he said. He says, because the God in whose very hand your breath is, you have not glorified. And you know what? That same thing is true of every human being. The God in whose very hand your breath is. We breathe God's air. We do it with the ability that he gave us, but we don't glorify him. And this is what brought the judgment on Belshazzar. And of course, these are the kinds of things that will bring the judgment upon this world eventually. But the author, he is going uh, to lengths to remind his listeners 
of who the Son is. But now here's where it gets completely mind-boggling. So he's the heir of everything. Every, he owns everything. He made everything. He sustains everything. He is God. He's God the Son. He radiates forth the glory of God. He's the exact representation of the Father in human form. And then we come to this, when he had by himself purged our sins. This takes it to a whole nother level. To think that this God condescends to purge our sins. He comes down. What does he have to do in order to purge our sins? He has to become a human being. And not only does he have to become a human being, but in order to purge our sins, he has to offer a sacrifice for sin, but there's nothing that is sufficient apart from himself. So when he by himself had purged our sins, he comes as both priest and sacrifice. He is the great priest, the high priest, who's offering up the, uh, the sacrifice for sin on the Day of Atonement, the blood of the lamb, but he's the lamb. He's the one. And this, I think, again, going back to the original recipients of the letter, the readers, all of a sudden, you know, the author's bringing to their mind who the Messiah is, but then he's reminding them of, of how he condescended out of his love, of how his mercy was so unbelievable that he would purge us of our sins himself by offering up himself. And that is what he did. You see, all of these things are meant to, to bring them to that place of, of you know, snapping back into reality and saying, well, what am I doing? What am I thinking? How could I ever for a minute think that I would return to this system, this ritualistic system? And, and for us today, it should do the same thing. How could I ever think of going anywhere but Jesus? Where could you possibly go? There's nowhere to go. There's nothing. Everything is about him. He's the alpha, the omega. And even though we don't see it right now because it's obscured by the darkness in the world and all, if you, if you look close enough, if you can look, you, can, you know, it's a cloudy day. You look up, you might not see the sun, but you know it's there, right? Because it's light. And so even though the world is in, to a certain degree shrouded in, in moral darkness and spiritual darkness, yet there's still plenty of evidence breaking through all of that to show us the reality of a God who created everything, but also a God who loves us and redeemed us by purging us of our sins. And then the final thing, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. And here's the declaration that he is the ruler of the universe. Now, think about it. He's the, he's the heir of everything. He's the creator of everything. He's the sustainer of everything. So in one sense, you could argue, well, Jesus has always been the ruler of the universe. Yes, he has, but there's one difference now. Now he rules it as a man. See, Jesus Christ, here's the great, this is the great act of, conda, uh, the, the great consending act of Christ was not that he temporarily became a man, he permanently became a man. And today, there is a man, a human being, who is nonetheless God, but he's a human being sitting at the right hand of the Father as the ruler of the universe. He rules the universe as the God-man. He rules the universe on behalf of man. Now, it says that he sat down, and that's very significant it's very significant. One writer said this, the potent imagery of sitting on the cosmic throne has only one attested significance. It indicates Christ's participation in the unique sovereignty of God over the world. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, which means that God is in control of everything, when we talk about God's providence, means that he's orchestrating and directing the affairs of the world, we need to remember that we're talking about Christ. 
When we say God is sovereign, we could equally be saying Christ is sovereign because that's the point. He's sitting at the right hand of God, the place of honor and authority. But again, he's sitting, which is also significant in relation to the fact that that he uh, came as a priest. And the, the significance is this. None of the former priests could ever sit. When the tabernacle was built and then the, the temple later, and they had the various furnishings, they had the candlestick and they had the table of the showbread and they had the, the altar of incense and they had the laver and the different things. And then in the Holy of Holies, you remember they had the Ark of the Covenant, but you know what they did not have? They did not have a chair. There was no chair because the priest work was never done. The priest work went on and on and on, and it was never done. It was never finished. It was never accomplished. Jesus, having by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the Father. You see, he sat down because he finished the work. And he sits now as a priest and a king upon his throne. And again, this is all prophetic. This is what the scripture said uh, in, in the, under the law, the priest and the, and the monarchy were always to be separated. The kings were from Judah and the priests were from Levi. And you, you couldn't cross those two. A Levite couldn't become a priest and a, and a, and a king of the line of Judah couldn't, um, I mean, a Levite couldn't become a king and a, and a king couldn't become a priest. On one occasion, Uzziah who was the king, he decided, well, I'm the king, so I guess I could be a priest too. He went in the temple, he offered a sacrifice, he was stricken with leprosy till the day he died. It was a reminder from God. Because that that privilege of combining the priest and the king was designated for the Messiah. Zechariah's prophecy said that he shall be both priest and king sitting upon his throne. And as we go further into this uh, letter to the Hebrews, it explains that his priesthood is not Levitical. It's not from Aaron. It's from Melchizedek. So he is a priest, but from a different order. So again, all of these things are things that are meant for especially for those ancient Hebrews who were considering a return back to Judaism, it, it was all meant to show them the utter folly of such a move. And then finally, he's seated there at God's right hand till his enemies become his footstool. Jesus finished the work. He is presently sitting at the right hand of God. What is he doing there? Well, he's making intercession for us. We know that. But he's sitting, waiting till God makes his enemies his footstool. And one day, just as sure as we're standing here, I'm standing here, you're sitting here, we're t- I'm talking, you're listening, we're all breathing, just as sure as that, he's gonna set his king on his holy hill of Zion. And so seeing the supremacy of the Son of God as the author intends us to do, how can we do anything less than give ourselves entirely to worshiping and serving him? You know, this is it. When you really lay hold of who Jesus is, you realize everything, you know, he's called the Alpha, the Omega for a reason. Everything began with him, everything's gonna end with him, and everything in between. It's all ultimately about him. And anything that's not about him is just a revolt against him, and that revolt is gonna be put down. So how could we do anything less than give ourselves entirely to worshiping and serving him? If we're in our right minds, we won't even think about doing that. If I'm thinking about doing that, then I just something's gone wrong in my thinking process. But these things were written to bring us to our senses, to make us realize just who it is that we are dealing with here and that we would in response give ourselves entirely to him. And how could we do anything less when we think of what this great inconceivable God. You know, at the end of the day, God is really, truly inconceivable. 
you know, going back to, you know, the vastness of the universe, going back to the, um, the subatomic world, you know, sometimes I read about these things, and, and when I read about them, I just think, okay, this is way too scary. <laughs> this is way too scary. A God that can invent these things, a God that brings these things into existence and holds them, it, you know, there's, there's a moment where it just becomes really frightening. You see why people, uh, you know, in the scriptures, when they had a true uh, encounter with God, they often fell down to the earth like they were dead. But when you see that, when you just get a little glimpse of it, you think, how can I think of anything else? How could I give myself to anything else? How could I, for a moment, think that, that worshiping or serving anyone but the living God would be remotely sane? It would be totally insane not to do it. And so may, may, may these verses have the same impact on us. And when we go out into our world, when we walk out the door each day and we walk back out into the world or when we're lying on our pillows at night and we're falling off to sleep, may we remember that all of this is because of him and may we always continually give ourselves afresh to him.